Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Desire the unadulterated milk of the word like a newborn baby that you may grow thereby. His divine power has given to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us many great and ex- many exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them by means of truth. Your word is truth. Before we open God's word this morning, let's bow our heads together in prayer. Our Father, we're so thankful that we have understanding of who we are in Christ because we have your word. And that being in the body of Christ, the church, that we have incredible blessings and privileges. As we've studied in Ephesians 1, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. And part of that, as Paul describes in Ephesians 2, is being part of this new entity, this new organism called the church that is a a new man, a new body, a new building, a new temple. And that with that, we have a foundation for understanding what it means to worship together as the body of Christ, as the church. So Father, today as we study this, we pray that you would help us to understand the significance of the church, not just this local church, but the universal church, the body of Christ, that we might learn to identify ourselves within that larger entity as we seek to worship you and to give praise to you. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We are continuing our study of worship. We're talking about congregational worship and congregational singing. And what we have come to understand very clearly is that the Bible defines for us what worship is. God defines for us what worship is. We have seen that God defines what is acceptable worship and what is unacceptable worship. And in the Old Testament, there are numerous examples when God has strongly punished those who offered wrong kinds of worship. And so we have to understand what this means. This is part of a topical series that I started several lessons back on worship because it comes out of our study of this great passage that begins in Ephesians 5.16 actually, but in Ephesians 5.18 we're given the command to be filled by means of God the Holy Spirit. And then there are several results that come from that which we will be spending time on, but the very beginning of this in verses 19, 20, and uh, 21, all relate to worship. And it begins with singing psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms. That This is not just some sort of add-on. It's not just something introductory you do and uh, that starts a uh, worship service on Sunday morning, but it's integral to our spiritual life And it's integral to our role as believers in Christ in this church age as members of this new temple that God the Holy Spirit is building and constructing. And so since it is being built and constructed by means of God the Holy Spirit, and we are commanded in Galatians 5.16 to walk by means of the Spirit, and we are told in Ephesians 5:16 that we are 5:18 that we are to uh, be filled by means of the Spirit. We see that all of this works together to orient us to this that 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 what we are doing is part of something much larger, much greater than just what's going on in individual local churches or this individual local church. And we have seen in Colossians 3, 16 that the command is different. The command is to let the word of Christ 
make its home in us, usually translated richly dwell within us, but it's the idea of making itself at home in your life and the same result. So we see that uh, by the filling, by the Holy Spirit, we are filled with the Word of Christ and the results are the same. It's admonishing and teaching one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, I want to point something out here that I don't think I've emphasized is that this teaching and admonishing is directed to one another. Now there's a number of passages in the New Testament that are addressed to believers in the church age of what we are to do for one another. We are to encourage one another, admonish one another, we are to pray for one another, we are to love one another. All of these are directed to what is to take place between believers in the body of Christ and specifically within uh, the body of a local church. And part of this indicates that, that if we are to be teaching and admonishing one another through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, that me- puts an emphasis on corporate singing. It puts an emphasis on the body of Christ is to be singing corporately. Now that that truth, that doctrinal truth, was lost during the Middle Ages. From the early Middle Ages, somewhere around the 6th century, 7th century AD, until you get to the Protestant Reformation, which began in 1517, that what had gradually taken place was that worship became something that was for spectators and that worship was led by a uh, clergy that kept everything in kind of behind a screen. So you really didn't know. It, was, it wasn't participatory. You came and you watched. It was a show. We've sort of gone full circle now because in a lot of modern churches, again, the congregation doesn't participate much. It has to do with watching uh, the entertainment of a so-called worship team. And the words for the contemporary music is projected up on the screen, but without music. And so it really limits the congregation's participation. In fact, I've been in a number of these services, and a lot of people don't even know what the music is because they can't see it. A lot of people today are impoverished in their education. They don't know how to read music, and so it doesn't matter. And so the quality of congregational singing has been greatly diminished. And this is really sad, and, um, and it has changed um, in a lot of different ways. And I recognize that this topic and what we're studying uh, are not are views that are not very, very popular at all today. And uh, that what I am teaching and what I am saying and my views, which are derived from Scripture, are not the result of um, what is popular. And so as we've looked at this, I've identified our assumptions that the scripture is our sole authority in worship, that we are to look to the scriptures. We believe the scriptures are sufficient for everything. That means that we don't need to look to principles of sociology or psychology, principles of business economics or group dynamics to understand the church. We need to look to the scriptures and that the idea of corporate worship in the body of Christ flows out of our understanding of what the Bible teaches about the nature of the church. Theologically, this term is ecclesiology. And ecclesiology covers a number of different topics, but one of them has to do with the uh, ministry of the local church and worship within the, the local church. And so we have to, once again, just go to God who alone defines our worship. And so we have to learn to evaluate uh, music. So what we have done is walk through a process. Because if we are worshiping the God of the Bible, then we first of all have to start with God. 
who is he and why do we worship him? And so I began looking at what the Bible teaches about his immensity, that God is not like anything in his creation. We've emphasized the creator-creature distinction, and as part of that we see that God is larger than his creation. He's uh, larger than anything. Everything that exists other than God was brought into existence by God. And so because God is so great and we are his creatures, we are to worship him. As part of that, we understand the holiness of God, that this word doesn't mean uh, they had the idea of moral purity or righteousness, which is how it's often taught, but is the idea that God is set apart and distinct and unique. That holiness has to do with that which is, uh, when it is applied to the uh, non-moral um, articles of furniture in the tabernacle and the temple, uh, they can be neither moral nor immoral. They cannot be righteous or unrighteous, but they are set apart to the service of God. And when it's applied to God, He is set apart from His creation. And so we must recognize that when we are worshiping God as this unique, one-of-a-kind, holy God that is beyond His creation and greater than His creation, that what we are doing is different from anything else that we do in life. We are, it is set apart for something unique and distinctive. So we talked about the meaning of worship, that the words indicate a submission to God's authority, which means submission to the Word of God in terms of what it teaches us. We're not here to do what makes us feel good and what we like to have our opinions uh, validated by uh, misinterpretations of Scripture, but by coming to understand what the Bible actually teaches us. We've looked at corporate worship, that this is different from individual worship, but individual worship informs our corporate worship. And individual worship is to be part of our walk with the Lord day in and day out. From there we looked at the origins of music, seeing that music existed before there was ever sin, either in human history or in the angelic realm that music always existed in the mind of God and music was part of the angelic creation and music was part of uh, the role of the angel named uh, in so many translations is Lucifer. He fell in sin and became known as Satan but he was a master uh, musician. And so we see that, that everything that he touches is corrupted and distorted and made something distinct from the character of God. And then we looked at the elements and forms of worship. Re pointing out that everything ultimately goes back to an understanding of the attributes of God, that he is sovereign, that he is righteous, perfect righteousness. All that he thinks, all that he does aligns perfectly with his absolute standard of righteousness. He is just in his application of that standard. He loves in a perfect way that is different from how we love in that it is based upon his righteousness, his justice, and his omniscience, and his omnipotence. And so this helps us to understand the uniqueness of what our worship is, what, of what it should consist. Last time I talked about the fact that this relates to worldview. Music relates to worldview and beauty, something that is called aesthetics. And that aesthetics comes out of a worldview that is grounded in how we think about ultimate reality. And so we went through this last time and I pointed out with this diagram that everybody has a worldview. Yours may not have been thought through very carefully. Yours may be just cobbled together with different opinions that you have and you've never really thought about it. But everybody has a worldview. And as you look at all of the details of life, you filter it through that worldview. So worldview is made up of their view of ultimate reality. What exists eternally? Is there a God or not a God? Uh, what is the nature of life? All of these questions come out of ultimate reality. Then it develops a view from that as to what is the significance of the human race. 
Is the human race just simply some accident that occurred as a result of some electrical discharge on a, on a mass of protoplasm at some time uh, millions of years ago that somehow developed in from or inorganic life, organic life, and then gradually over time evolved into something. But ultimately it means that we're all products of an accident and so there's no purpose and meaning in life. Or did God create us in his image and likeness so that we are to reflect his character to his creation? That leads to an understanding of how we know what we know and that there is truth as opposed to everybody makes up their own truth. And that leads to a view of what's right and wrong and what's valuable. And then in turn that will lead to a view of, of beauty and truth. So we have ideas about origins and religion and man and nature and creation, science and math, society, suffering, solutions, law, and art, music, and theater. All come out of a person's worldview. Now I had somebody came up to me last week after class and they've been going back to school and they said, well, I had a course in philosophy last semester and you summarized everything I learned in one semester in about an hour last week. This is just basic philosophy 101. There's no real disagreement that this is the role and function of a worldview. What the elements are are going to be uh, and how they're portrayed is going to be somewhat different. And then I use this diagram to show this and I just want to remind you that this is behind it is an iceberg. Most of it is underwater. An iceberg 90 percent is underwater but only about 10 percent is visible. And so when we come to discussing a lot of things, for example uh, music, art, theater, uh, what's good literature, what's bad literature, uh, we also get into things related to, well, is this a good law or a bad law? Whenever we use terms like good or bad, we're presupposing that there's some sort of uh, absolute. Otherwise, it's all good and it's all bad because if there, if there aren't eternal, unchangeable absolutes, what right does anybody have to talk about good or bad? That those terms are evaluative terms that all have reference to some external reference point. But if there is no external reference point, where do you get those ideas? Because over on this side of the room you've got about maybe 25, 30 people with 25 or 30 different values. Who's right? Who's wrong? Oh, you can't even have right or wrong. So we end up discussing lots of things up here, but we don't go down to the very bottom. Everything up here Every evaluation that we make, every statement that we make that is related to an evaluation has its roots way down here in our understanding of ultimate reality. For the Bible, ultimate reality is the God of the Bible who created all things so that everything that is was created by him and apart from him nothing that is was created. So that, what, that makes up our worldview. So we're down here and when I at, talk about uh, music and corporate worship, this is grounded, as we know in Scripture, it is grounded in understanding what the church is. What is the church? Is the church a social organization? Was the church just something that uh, sort of developed by accident. Uh, a couple of thousand years ago Christians decided they wanted to get together. We have to understand this. So down here under this concept of metaphysics, ultimate reality and God, this is where we place Christ and this is and Christ says that we are his church. So we have to understand that we start there. What is the nature of the church? Now a number of years ago I had a family that was part of West Houston Bible Church. And they decided to leave. And they had the um, good manners to call me and say they wanted to talk over some things with me before they left. And one of the things they said was, well, we're leaving because this church is never going to grow as long as you just sing traditional hymns. Think about that. What is the assumption there? <laughs> 
they are saying that um, the church doesn't grow, you won't attract young people if you don't sing a certain kind of music, one that they are attracted to. Now, we have to evaluate that statement. Is that true or is that false? Well, I think it's true that if we sing a certain kind of music, we may not attract too many people from the culture. But is that a bad thing? Or is that a good thing? What underlies that? See, there are certain assumptions that are made when you make a statement like that. And so we have to address those assumptions first assumption here is that the worship of the church should be attractive to those who are unbelievers, those who are outside of the church. Uh, They should be attractive to those who are maybe baby believers, but they've just never learned enough about what the Bible teaches and says to have their value systems totally changed by the ministry of God's Word and the Holy Spirit. And so there's an assumption in a lot of evangelicalism today that the role of the meeting of the church is to be attractive to unbelievers. So my question, first question that occurs to me, did Jesus make his ministry attractive to unbelievers? No, he did not. Parts of his ministry were attractive because to certain people who were uh, the outcasts of the religious legalistic society at the time, Jesus' uh, message of God's grace and the free offer of salvation was very welcome. But to those who were in the religious establishment, uh, it was not welcome. It It was rejected. Jesus did not make his ministry, though, conform to the standards of the culture of his day in either way. He doesn't give approval to those who were involved in the sins of the culture at that time, whether it was the immoral side or whether it was the religious self-righteous side. Another assumption is that the purpose of the church is to enable its own growth. There's a movement that has its roots and the seeds that were planted in the 1960s that uh, grew uh, uh, an evil plant in the 70s and started producing outrageous fruit in the 80s and following called the church growth movement. And part of the assumption here was that we need to look to the world, to sociology, psychology, business models, economics, in order to gain our principles of how to build a church. And is that correct? Is that what we should do? Or should we just look to the Bible alone? And there were those of us when I went through seminary that, that questioned this, and there were conflicts that occurred at, at that time and disagreements that occurred because uh, we kept, kept saying, we, we've got things wrong. We have to look to the Scriptures So certain questions have to be addressed. First of all, what is the purpose of the meeting of the church? Why are we here? Why do we do this every Sunday morning, Tuesday night, and Thursday night? Second, what is the purpose of congregational music? Is this just sort of a warm-up? Is this something that just sort of relaxes everybody, makes them feel good, and makes them feel comfortable? Or is it something vastly different that doesn't conform and should not conform to everything in the culture? Third, should we conform to cultural norms in what we do on Sunday morning? Uh, What about so-called traditional hymns? One of the objections that you will hear from the, those who are into contemporary music is, well, at one time those traditional hymns were different from the culture. Uh, I've heard uh, myths that are fake news that when Luther wrote uh, Mighty Fortresses Are God, he used a bar tune and that was popular. No, he didn't. I mean, I've heard that from so many people, but no, he didn't. You've got to know your history. He wrote his own music. Luther, Martin Luther, who was the father of the Protestant Reformation, was a tremendous musician. In fact, one of the things that Luther did 
was that he brought congregational music back into the meeting of the church. Remember earlier I said during the Middle Ages in the, from the early church, which was what became the Roman Catholic Church, and these ideas continued even after the uh, 11th century when the uh, Eastern Church split off into Eastern Orthodoxy and all of its branches from Russian, Ukrainian, Greek, Syrian, Armenian Orthodoxy. They still maintain this view of worship that was more of a spectator event than a participatory event. And so in the Roman Catholic Church, Orthodox churches, until Luther came along, there was no congregational singing. And that's still true outside of the United States and in, except places that maybe were influenced some by some uh, U.S. procedures. In the U.S., after the War for Independence that the, uh, we established the Free Association for Religious Groups. In other words, under the First Amendment, uh, the, the state and the states were no longer going to be the source of funding for the various denominations. I took a few decades before that worked itself out. Uh, but what, what happened as a result of that is that because this was predominantly a Protestant churched nation, that if you were coming if, and you wanted to attract people to your Roman Catholic or Greek Orthodox or Eastern Orthodox views, you had to make your service uh, something like the Baptist, Methodist, and others uh, in order to attract them. And so you go to a Roman Catholic church service and maybe I've never been to a, an American Orthodox service, uh, but I, uh, others, they will have con some congregational singing because they need to conform a little bit to what is accepted in American church culture. So, it, But outside of this, there's no congregational singing. So that's very important. And when Luther wrote and when many of the great hymn writers wrote in the uh, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century, they wrote in a culture that was still a Judeo-Christian culture. Because what established from the uh, really the 4th through the 10th centuries as Christianity influenced all of Europe was that Europe all functioned. They may not have all been Christians, they may not have understood the gospel, they may have had all kinds of theological problems, but they understood that there was a triune God who created the heavens, the earth, and the seas, and all that was in them. And, so they, and that this God gave us law. And so that they had a Judeo-Christian worldview even though a lot of their theology was not necessarily correct. But over the years, especially with the Protestant Reformation, it became correct. So what you see is today you see a lot of people coming out of a, of a neo-pagan, relativistic, postmodern culture. They're a Christian for a year. They write their own music. They write their own songs. They have uh, less than a millimeter of depth in their theology and understanding of God. And their lyrics and their music reflect it. Because the culture they came out of was not a Judeo-Christian culture. But in the pro time from the Protestant Reformation on, when you have the flourishing of the writing of hymns, those people came out of a Judeo-Christian worldview, so they're thinking more and more biblically, and they have a deeper, richer spiritual life. And you come to understand that as you read the stories of the hymn writers and the musicians. So it's important to understand all of these things. So what I'm doing this morning is just introducing us to what the Bible teaches about the nature of the church. So is the church a social organism? Is the church an evangelistic organization? Uh, third, is the church an organization which follows the norms of any other organization and which should be studied via sociological and psychologically derived standards? Now these are all very important questions. The church is not an organization, it is an organism. 
It is an organism that was given birth to supernaturally after the cross. And as such, it has dynamics that may be similar to other organizations, but they are derived from its supernatural origin. It is was given birth to by, uh, by the Trinity, by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we learn, first of all, that the church was not in existence in the Old Testament. You, what you had in the Old Testament as corporate worship was part of Israel under the Mosaic Covenant. Before that there was individual worship and we've studied that historically. The church was not in existence in the Old Testament or during the time period of Christ's incarnation when he was bodily on the earth. Jesus first mentions the church in Matthew 16, 18. Here's the context. He's with his disciples and he says, well, who do men say that I am? You're out there among the people. What do they, who do they say I am? And Peter said, um, uh, I, oh, the other disciples said, well, some think you're, you're Moses and some think you're John the Baptist, some think you're Elijah. And so Jesus then says in verse 15, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answers correctly. He says, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And so Jesus then answers, addresses him and he says, blessed are you, sign of Barjona, that is Simon, son of John. He says, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And then he says, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and this is a play on words because the name Peter Petros refers to a small stone. He says, you are Peter, and on this rock, and he uses a larger uh, word for, that means rock, that's a, a cognate of Petros. He says, I will build my church. Now we have to remember that in the Old Testament, one of the names and titles, sort of nicknames for God was the rock. Again and again, God is described as the rock. You know, we sing the hymn, Rock of Ages. So he says, uh, on this rock, and he's really talking about himself because of his claim to be God. On this rock, I will build my church. Not the church planters, not the church growth people. I will build my church. Jesus takes ownership for building the church. I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. So, so the church will not, cannot, and never will be destroyed because we are protected by the founder, the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, so Jesus has said that he will build his church. It's very clear. He takes ownership for building the church. Third point, in John 21, Jesus delegates responsibility for building the church to the apostles. I've just seen if anybody was still awake. Jesus delegated responsibility of teaching and training those in the church to the apostles, but he still maintains control, I will build my church. So three times he tells Peter, again, he's having this conversation with the same person. He tells Peter, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, tend my sheep. So the role of the apostles and the role of the pastor is to feed the sheep, to teach them the word of God. It's not their job to build a church. Whose job is it to build a church? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Why? Because he is the head of the church. The church is his body. And so he is the one who directs the church and he directs certain people to different specific job responsibilities. And the job responsibility of the, uh, uh, of the pastor is to feed the sheep. Several years ago, a young man in this church asked me, because he and his wife had come out of another church, and then not long after that, the pastor of that church uh, resigned due to, due to stress and being overworked. And he said, Robbie, I've known you in the menu, pastors you know for a long time. I don't see them uh, 
bailing out because they're, they've overworked themselves and they're exhausted. And I said, that's because they're not trying to build a church. They're just teaching the Word. They don't get stressed out over the job. They're not overworked. The job of the pastor is to feed the sheep. The job of the Lord Jesus Christ is to build a church. But see, you have these people that come along and they develop all these methodologies derived from the way businesses do things in the world for trying to build the church, including we're going to sing the kind of songs that make people happy and make them feel good and that uh, are similar to the kind of music they listen to in the radio. And we'll have huge crowds. Yeah, but you've got unbiblical doctrine. And there's no teaching. And you're not doing what the Bible said to do, which is to feed the sheep and to equip the saints. This is what Paul says in Ephesians 4, 11, and 12, that the role of the pastor teacher and the evangelist is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. But if you're not doing that, you're trying to do everything yourself, including Jesus' job of building the church. And you're introducing all kinds of false methodologies into the function of the church. So under point five, the church was created only after Christ had broken down the middle wall of separation, which is defined in that context as the Mosaic law. And then he created in himself one new man from the two, the two being Jews and Gentiles. So in Ephesians 2.15, it says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, That is the law of commandments, the Mosaic law, contained in ordinances so as to create something new. Every time you have this language, it always involves this word create. And here he's created himself, one new man from the two, thus making peace. Now this new man is further described in Ephesians 2.16 as one new body. It's described as members of the household of God. This is not a term that relates to any Old Testament saints. It is the church, the household of God. It is a new entity according to Ephesians 2.19. And in Ephesians 2.2 we learn it's built on the, that should be 2.20, it's built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Who's building it? the Lord Jesus Christ. The foundation is the apostles and prophets. The cornerstone is the Lord Jesus Christ. So the foundation's the apostles and prophets. He's the cornerstone and he's the one who's building the church and it's growing into a new building which is called a holy temple to the Lord in Ephesians 2.21 and a dwelling place of God the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 2.22. This emphasizes the uniqueness of what we are doing. What's the role of a temple? It's a place where people come to worship God. So the body of Christ is being built by God the Holy Spirit, and when we're walking by the Spirit and being filled by the Spirit, then the church as a whole, universal church, and the individual manifestations of it in the local church manifest this reality of biblical worship. It's interesting that when the word temple is used there, it is the Greek word naos. Now this is interesting. There are two words in the New Testament translated temple. One is the word heros. Now heros referred to the whole complex, the whole temple complex, the outer courtyards, uh, the outer buildings, the courtyard of the Gentiles, courtyard of the women, uh, the areas in the, in the uh, uh, first uh, or in the second temple where the money changers were. All of that would be part of the heros. The naos refers to the inner sanctum, the holy of holies, the primary building where God met man. That's where worship took place ultimately in the, in the uh, worship of the Old Testament. So the conclusion is th- of this is that the universal church is this new temple. And each individual congregation is a manifestation, a finite representation of the new man, new body, new building, and new temple. 
So West Houston Bible Church is just one local finite representation of the universal church, which includes believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, dead and already face to face with the Lord, and living. That's the living, that's the universal church. Therefore, the guidelines for the conduct of this new entity are not derived from sociology or psychology or group dynamics or popularity or external culture, but exclusively from the Word of God. It always has to come back to what does the Bible say? And we keep going back to uh, Romans 12 too, that we are not to be pressed into the mold of the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age around us. So now we're going to run quickly through what the Bible teaches about the purpose of the meeting of the church. Why do we meet? Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. He himself, that is Christ, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Now we know that the gift of prophecy and the gift of, of uh, apostle were limited to the first century. So all we have today are evangelists, and we've gone through studies, a pastor-teacher should be understood as a sort of a, a, as, as two terms relating to the same person. These are primarily offices or leaders as opposed to spiritual gifts, but these spiritual gifts are mentioned other places in the New Testament. But Christ gave these to us for the purpose of equipping the saints for the work of ministry. For the edifying, so equipping and edifying, that's the purpose of the, of the local church. And as an outreach from that is evangelism. Those are the three E's, equipping, edification, and evangelism. That's why a local church exists. But evangelism takes place when you go out these doors into your mission field. There's some evangelism that takes place here because you can never assume that everybody here is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there are, the, a pastor needs to do the work of the evangelist as, as we see. So this is to go on until we all come to the unity of the faith. It's doctrinal. It, it's a belief system and we have to come to understand what that means. To the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ for the purpose that we should no longer be children. In other words, your goal in going to the local church is to stop being a, a spiritual baby, stop being a spiritual child, and learn to be a spiritual adult, to be grown up and be able to function within the realms of your spiritual gift and your ministries, no longer being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. So, observations. Number one, the four gifts listed in contact, context refer to the gifted leaders which of course possess these gifts. And we see these mentioned in Romans 12, 7 and 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 30. So these are gifted men given to teach and to equip, to feed the sheep. That's their job. Okay? Second, Christ gave these gifted men to the church because he's the head of the church. He is the commanding general of the body of Christ. And so he has the authority to determine who does what job, and he writes the job descriptions. Ephesians 1.22, and he, referring to God the Father, put all things under his feet, the Lord Jesus Christ, and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Ephesians 4.15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, that is Christ. Third observation, the purpose for these four leadership positions, specifically for today evangelists and pastor teachers, is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. I'm like a coach and I have to train you to be able to function in your spiritual life, and I do that by teaching the Word. That is what Scripture says. But I also uh, need to do the work of an evangelist. 2 Timothy 4.5 says, so that the meeting of the church is for the equipping of believers, 
not for making unbelievers feel comfortable or as the means of evangelism. However, evangelism does take place. 2 Timothy 4 5, Paul tells Timothy in his last letter, his last epistle, to train this young pastor who's probably in his late 30s by now. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So a pastor is primarily to feed the sheep, but we, we always need to be reminded of our salvation. For one thing, we need to learn, it, learn all the dynamics of it better, but we need to hear somebody who knows give the gospel, and then when you get out and you start talking to somebody, you're going to hear my voice in your head, and you're going to be able to clearly explain the gospel to somebody. And you're going to hear, hopefully, the Holy Spirit bringing verses to your mind that you have memorized. Fifth, the meeting of the church through the ordinances teaches and proclaims salvation. 1 Corinthians 11.26, Paul says that when you're observing the Lord's table, you're proclaiming the Lord's death until He comes. Six, we see that the meeting of the church is for corporate prayer. We see this in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 3, where Paul says, Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior." The seventh thing about the meeting of the church is it's for the proclamation of the word, which includes convincing people of its truthfulness, rebuking, uh, telling them what is wrong, exhorting what is challenging them, and teaching or instructing them. And 2 Timothy 4.2, Paul says, preach the word. doesn't stop there. It's a proclamation of the word. And then he tells you how. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, Exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come, and I might add, and now is, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers who are false teachers. 2 Timothy 4 4 goes on to say, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of the evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So what are the conclusions? Number one, the church has a supernatural divine origin and is defined in all of its aspects by the Word of God. You don't have to go to a purpose-driven church to find out what a church is supposed to do. You don't go to church growth manuals to figure it out. You don't go to books that say, you know, how you can have a happy and meaningful life or have your best life now or all of these other things that have no, uh, only a superficial uh, acquaintance with some biblical vocabulary but twist it and distort it. Second, though the church certainly has social, psychological, and musical aspects as well as pedagogical aspects, It is not to be defined, managed, directed by these autonomous human viewpoint systems. We have to go to the Word of God to find out what Jesus says about how to do it. And third, the church is not designed to make unbelievers comfortable, but to teach them how to think, live, talk, and conduct their lives in a way that is different from the world or culture around them. And so worship, when we come together, singing is something that should be defined by Scripture. The content and music should fit together to exalt the Creator God of the universe, and we do not define it or shape it on the viewpoint of the world as to what is acceptable, profitable, or makes us feel good. The church is different. It is God's organization. It is not an organization of man. And what has happened in the world today is that pastors and churches have forgotten that. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together today to be reminded of what church is, what we're supposed to be doing in church, 
and how we are to sing congregationally, the significance of congregational singing and, and how you have defined that in your word. Father, we pray too that if anyone here or anyone listening online or anyone who listens uh, down the road to this message that if they have never trusted in Christ as Savior that this is the key to eternal life. The Bible is very clear. It is not on the basis of any morality on our part, any righteousness on our part, any ritual on our part. It is not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to your mercy. We are saved by grace through faith, and that not of works, lest any man should boast. We are saved by simply believing that Jesus Christ is who he said he was, the eternal second person of the Trinity who entered into human history, took on humanity for himself, so that he could go to the cross and die as our substitute, pay the penalty for our sins so that we would not have to do anything other than accept that payment on our behalf, trusting in Him and Him alone for our eternal salvation. So Father, we pray that today as we go about our lives in the face of this oncoming storm, that we might trust in You, that You might protect us and take care of us and provide for us as we uh, go through the next 24 to 48 hours, and knowing that no matter what happens, that You are the one who guides, directs, and preserves us. And you will give us perhaps many opportunities to encourage and strengthen others who may suffer some damage, some loss uh, during this storm. But above all, Father, we trust you in all things, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's bow as we close our service in prayer this morning. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your wonderful word that teaches us how to worship you so that we can be equipped and edified and be prepared to bring the gospel to those who need it that we come into contact with. And we just thank you so much for your wonderful provision for us in the local church here. And in closing, Father, we just uh, want to reiterate what, reiterate what our pastor said about the upcoming weather event. We just pray that you'd watch over and protect us during the storm. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.